Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's not exactly a sunny day, but it's a good day because we're all gathered here in worship together this morning. A few announcements that I would like to bring to your attention. First of all, um, as we continue to uh, battle this new variant of the Omicron uh, coronavirus, if you are able to please wear a mask while you are indoors so that we can protect everyone, including yourself, from further transmission. I know that several families within our congregation have uh, had the coronavirus and been infected and are now recovering at home. And so it's just wise. If you can wear your mask when you're indoors, it will help all of us to get through this a little bit faster. Um, if you are not comfortable coming inside to worship, we do have um, and are continuing to have the parking lot service outside. You can listen to that on 89.5, or you can watch this service online. It will be available tomorrow morning when uh, our email is sent out. So uh, it's wonderful to have you here. There's many ways in which we can gather for worship, and that's always a good thing. A few other announcements. If you have a prayer concern that you would like to share, there are prayer cards in the pews. If you will take one of those, fill it out, and then as we are singing the first hymn, we will collect those prayer cards, and they will be shared um, during our worship service today. If you have a confidential prayer, just mark that on the card, and that will not be shared. That will just go directly to me. There are a number of opportunities you'll see in your bulletin, opportunities to grow in your faith, and I want to lift up several of them to you right now. First of all, beginning this Tuesday, our Bible study, which is multi-generational, but the adult Bible study that Ken Sloan has been leading, will be also be offered at uh, noon on Tuesday in the, in the parlor. So if you are interested, please make a note and come and join us. It's a wonderful uh, Bible study. And it gives all of us an opportunity from our youngest who are going through it in Sunday school to adults like ourselves um, to really grow and study the Word of God and have something to talk about um, at the dinner table. We are also starting a, a prayer group, a women's prayer group that's beginning this Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock and Jocelyn O'Neill is leading that. The details are in the, uh, the bulletin this morning. And please consider that because we grow when we grow in our relationship with Christ and we grow in prayer. And so there again is another wonderful opportunity. We're really excited that next month we are going to be having a confirmation class for um, our young people. And let me see. Is there anyone here who might be interested in that confirmation class? Sophia, maybe, yeah, maybe. But we need mentors. And so we need people who will help work. You're interested too, oh, okay. So we need mentors to help with that confirmation class too. Um, the normal ages are usually for confirmation is 12, 12 and up. 12 and up for confirmation class. So we're glad that we have that. That's starting the end of February. We need mentors for that class. And our youth group is um, still going on. And we're really excited because um, on the 29th of this month, uh, the youth are going horseback riding. That's something I've always loved to do. I've even been thrown by a horse a couple of times. And that makes up for a lot of the reasons on why I am the way I am today. But it's, I love horseback riding. It would never keep me from going, and it's wonderful fun. So uh, we hope that our, uh, if you have a teen who is interested in going horseback riding, do the sign up. It's the 29th of January, and the cost is $35. Now, this is something I'm particularly interested in. We're having a family game night. And uh, I know that uh, our, many in our church don't know this, but I am quite a fantastic quiz master. You didn't know that. Yeah, they're still talking about me in Scotland. Um, 
So, uh, but that is February 2nd. We have a meal at 6 p.m. at Schaefer Hall. Um, you can sign up in the email that went out on Thursday, and I imagine it will be in um, upcoming emails as well. So you can sign up. Dinner is provided. It's $10 for adults and $5 for children. And I think that money is going for scholarships. Is that right? What's money? Yeah. I'm getting a nod. So the money goes to help our scholarship fund, too. So those are all wonderful things that we have coming up in the next few weeks. This morning, um, I'm very happy uh, to introduce you. Our worship leader this morning is from the church that I served in Kinross, Scotland. So her accent may throw you off a little bit, but it's wonderful to have Mrs. Enid Campbell joining us in worship this morning and helping lead worship. So we really do have an international uh, flair with us this morning. Beloved in Christ and everything we do, in word and in deed, may it be to the praise and glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. Good morning. Please stand for the call to worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and God's glory will appear over you. Holy and majestic God, we gather in worship in praise of your steadfast love. Fill our hearts until they overflow, so that we may be a living testimony of your grace in Jesus Christ. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Num
Who among us has not been enticed and led astray by idols? All of us come with a need to confess. Let us do so with trust in God's endless desire to forgive. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Loving Lord, we long to be your faithful people, but our good intentions run out and we come up empty. For all the ways we fall short in our sin, forgive us, gracious one. Change us like water into wine to become what the world lacks, that our community, our nation, our church, and all creation may know your justice and love. God has lifted us up from that, all that has pushed us down. Gone are old names of derision, forsaken, desolate, loser, nobody. Through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, God calls you by new names, wise, knowing, faithful healer, prophet, mystic. Hear, believe, and trust your new name. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come up. Hi. You guys want to have a seat right here? Do you want to come up, Sydney? <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. Hi. I have a few pictures that I'd like to show you. Here's the first picture. I know maybe in the back you can't see, but that's me standing in a white dress. <laughs> what day was this? Yeah, this was my wedding day. Hard to believe it was almost 22 years ago now. Um, I wanted to talk about some of the people that are in this picture besides me. Do you, see, do you see that lady standing right there? Her name is Nelda. Now Nelda is standing here in this family picture. That's all my brothers and sisters and my mom and my dad. And Nelda is standing in this picture, but you know what? Nelda wasn't part of our family. She um, had her own family. but. She was like a sister to my mother. So she kind of became my aunt. And we loved her very much. That's why she was invited to be in this picture with us on my wedding day with my family. Now, I had to say goodbye to Nelda a few years after this picture was taken. She went to go live with Jesus. And it was really sad. And we were all very, very sad. But at the same time, we were all so glad because more than anything else in the world, Nelda wanted to be with Jesus. So while we still miss her, we know she is where she wants to be. And I keep this picture so I can remember that she was there with me on this day. And she celebrated it with me and it was very special. Now there's a guy standing in the back. That's my dad. He was there too. And I'm glad he was. Here's another picture of my dad. This is him when he was three years old. Now, I didn't know him then, obviously. Um, but there are two other people in this picture, his mom and dad. Nope. 
<laughs> I didn't come along until my dad was in his 20s. <laughs> um, but that's his brother, Jim. And the other two people in here, those are my grandparents. And I didn't get to know my dad when he was three years old, but you know what? They used to tell me stories all the time. So I kind of got to know my dad when he was a little boy because of the stories that they used to tell me. And I keep this picture to remind me how much my grandparents loved me. I have had to say goodbye to them too. But I am so glad that they were part of my life and I keep this picture to remind me. Do you know who that is? Who is that? That's Brenna. <laughs> Here she is. Look at that. She looks so pretty in that picture. She had kind of a big birthday a couple, um, about a week ago. She turned 18. And she still lives with me. But very soon, I am going to have to say goodbye to Brenna. She's going to go live somewhere else. She's going to go to college. And then eventually she's going to have her own family and her own place to live. And I'm not going to get to see her as much. And that makes me really sad. I won't see her every day. But I have this picture to remind me of the time that we spent together when she was growing up. And I will get to talk to her, and I will get to see her some. You know, it's just not going to be every day. And so that's sad, but it's also glad, because I can't wait to see all the amazing things that she does, right? You know, the disciples had to say goodbye to Jesus, didn't they? Right? He left them. But before he left, he said that he was going to send his Holy Spirit to be with them when he was gone. So a way to remember him when he was gone. And while it was sad, because they were going to miss him a lot, they were his best friends, right? They were also glad because they got the Holy Spirit. And it was a new beginning for them, kind of like it will be for Brenna. It's sad and it's happy at the same time. So there's all, times, all kinds of ways that we have to say goodbye, but we know that God is always with us, right? Okay. Do, you, do either of you want to say a prayer? Sydney, you want to say a prayer? Okay. Dear God, thank you for helping us at all times that we need. Thank you for the food we eat, the water we drink, and everything. Amen. Amen. The first reading is Psalm 36, verse 5 to 10. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your salvation to the upright of heart. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
As we gather here today, there are many places in the world where there is conflict, injustice, poverty and hunger. May the leaders of the world come together with softened hearts and have the will to change things for the better without self-interest playing any part in their actions. Lord, we pray that climate change will be reversed and we can again look after this planet that you have given us to care for. Everyone and everything has a part to play and when species are lost, the chain is broken. Money and power play too big a part now in the decisions being made throughout the world to the detriment of the poor. We pray that this would change and that all peoples will be able to participate in your work. Lord, we pray for your church, both here and abroad, as we try to find new ways to bring your word to the people who do not yet know you. In these uncertain times, we pray for all frontline workers who face tough decisions each day. May you walk with them and carry their heavy burden. Thank you, Lord, that you are always available to hear our prayers and respond accordingly to your grace. And now, please hear the prayers of your people. Gracious God, you, we are reminded through your word that we are one and that Christians are united when we gather and lift our voices up in prayer. Lord, we pray for the members of this congregation. We pray for those who are suffering from anxiety and worry, from depression. These are stressful times, Lord, in our world and within this community with the continued presence of the coronavirus, with family and friends becoming sick, the uncertainty of things to come, the uncertainty of our way forward as a church. Let us turn and rest our hearts in you, O Holy Lord. Lord, we pray this morning for those who are battling cancer. We continue to lift up our prayers for Mason Middleback and for B. Walker, who's coping with stage four cancer. Lord, we pray for Connie Wright and Jim Chandler and for Sandra Wood, Bill and Judy's daughter, who is recovering from illness. And Lord, we lift up all those who are grieving this day from family and loss and Pay in particular to the family of Vivian Carney, who lost her husband this week, and Lynn Spots for the loss of her mother. We continue to pray for Dottie's daughter, Cindy, as she grieves the loss of her child. Gracious and holy God, give us eyes to see the hope and promise that comes with you that for those we have lost, their pain and suffering have passed, and they now are with you in paradise. Lord, lift our hearts to that hopeful prospect of a joyful reunion that we will share one day when we all dine once again at your table. It is in the name of our sovereign Lord Jesus Christ that we lift up these prayers, saying the words he taught his disciples, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing our next hymn, More Love to Thee, O Christ.
Please be seated. Everything that we have is a gift from God. Good to see you, Carla. Everything we have is a gift from God, a gracious and loving gift from God. You probably hear me better without my mask on, don't you? So whatever your heart calls you, give generously. Give to God the gifts of God's great fruit that he has so abundantly blessed us. In Jesus' name, let us receive the offering. Gracious God, we give you thanks that we have these tithes and gifts to offer. And in the words of our young friend Sidney, thank you for the food we eat, the things that we have to drink, and for being with us and helping us in all times. We give you our thanks and praise for these offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, we return to the Gospel of John and the memorable story of Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana. But before we hear these words of scripture, let's return to a few of the characteristics of our fourth gospel. First, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, we may wish to call John the ungospel because it is so unique and unlike the other gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke. Or like an onion, we find many more depths and understanding of meaning with each successive reading, just like peeling away the layers of an onion. However, whatever the uniqueness we unravel in these pages, the central theme shared by all the gospel remains, the authority of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
And the question for each of us, our willingness to live our lives as a reflection of that authority, not through power and self-grabbing interests, but through the love and unity that comes only through new life in Christ. So here are a few themes and questions you may wish to ponder as we listen to this morning's lesson. First, our story takes place at a wedding feast, the theme of a great banquet in preparation to welcome the messianic bridegroom and our salvation is a common thread in both the Old and New Testaments. And we also remember that each year we hold a great banquet here as Christians from many churches come to renew and deepen their faith through the great banquet. Second, regardless of the tone of the exchange between Jesus and his mother, both demonstrate obedience to the other. And finally, without any hocus pocus or any type of show to draw attention to himself, but just by his word, the attendees of the wedding feast enjoy the sweetest wine they have ever tasted, even if only the servants and Jesus' disciples are in the know as to how the water turned into wine. So please now join me as we read from the second chapter of John, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Beloved in Christ, the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as your word has been read and now proclaimed, quiet our hearts and minds to new understanding in how we can be your people this day. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was 1974. My friends Pam and Kathy and another gal whose name I can no longer remember were huddled together in my family's monster station wagon, driving together to Kalamazoo, Michigan, where our team would compete in the statewide bowling championships. Now, I have to confess, I am not now, or was I then, a very good bowler. But I loved it. I loved to go and throw the ball down the lane, particularly because it was something that my Uncle Ted enjoyed doing. My Uncle Ted was probably the nicest, kindest guy you would ever meet. He was very smart, very forgiving, especially to a student who never understood mathematics because he was a professor. And he was also the first in my family to see this 
church in his hometown as a teenager and wondered what was going on inside and became a member. And that led to all of my family joining a church. And so in addition to Ted's growing love of Christ and family, he also loved to go bowling twice a week. And so when he would come for a visit, I had the opportunity to spend time just with my Uncle Ted as we would go and throw a few balls down the lane. Now, mind you, my balls went more in the gutter. That's just how I rolled back then. Maybe I'm rolling that way today. We never know. But Ted would always offer a gentle word of encouragement. But on this particular day, in 1974, as my team entered the bowling competition, an amazing thing happened. I bowled like I had never bowled before in my life, not before and certainly not since. And I picked up strikes and spares with ease. It was amazing. The highest scores I had ever scored. And thanks to that remarkable turn of events, and the fact that I had an extraordinarily high handicap, because I really was a rotten bowler, <laughs> we came in 11th place in the state. We got, we got a plaque engraved with our names on it. Kathy Dane, 11th in the state. You didn't stink today as a bowler. <laughs> and we were thrilled. And my friends that I bowled with knew it was remarkable, but our opponents thought it was fixed, that I was a ringer, you know? But we didn't care. We had that plaque marking our day, a trophy to recognize our achievement. It was just wonderful. What brings us glory? In just a few weeks' time, two teams will take the playing fields to decide who is the best football team. The winner will take home a ring and the team a spectacular trophy. But in the quest to win, some teams will take shortcuts or use unethical means to have a hand on the prize. And we've all heard the stories of deflated footballs or stealing signs. We hear in the business world of insider trading that leads to personal gain. But what is the true path that leads each of us to win the prize that will never fade? And what are the risks we are willing to take? especially when that promised award still seems so elusive. The disciples were clearly on their journey with Jesus. They were early on. They had heard John the Baptist's confession that here was the Christ and followed, leaving their homes and their families, just to see if this man from Galilee was all that they had heard, the one and only Messiah. But perhaps after a few days of travel, the initial enthusiasm to follow this itinerant minister was wearing. And like the guests at the banquet, the wine had run dry. Maybe that's what you're feeling today. We've run the race. We know the prize that awaits, but we're running low on wine. We look around with worry or question our way ahead. We, we say we've done that before, hesitant to try it again, or become so comfortable in our traditions that we lose sight of the journey still ahead of us. We set our eyes on the dried up vines of worldly matters, forgetting the new wine that still awaits today and always through Jesus Christ. We look at our finances and worry. We look and wish we had more children in our pews and families, and we worry. We yearn for the church of the past when, right now, God is offering us new opportunities to be the church to the world. You know, when we stop and think about it, we are natural worriers. When we are kids, 
we worry about our grades, among other things. And as teens, we worry about who we will date. As young parents, we worry about how we will provide. As empty nesters, when we can retire as senior citizens, we worry about our health. Our worries are like dried up vines that keep us immobilized and unable to see the fullness that every breath can hold. In his sermon, What is Man?, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday we celebrate tomorrow, wrote, through his amazing capacity for memory and thought and imagination, man is able to leap oceans, break through walls, and rise above the limitations of time and space. Through his powers of memory, man can have communion with the past. Through his powers of imagination, man can embrace the uncertainties of the future. Along with this strong intellectual capacity in man, there is a will. Man has written himself the power of choosing his supreme end. Animals follow their natures, but man has the power of acting upon his own nature, almost as if from without, of guiding it within certain limits, and of modifying it by the choice of meaningful ends. Man is more than flesh and blood. Man is a spiritual being born to have communion with the eternal God of the universe. God creates every individual for a purpose to have fellowship with him. This is the ultimate meaning of the image of God. It is not that man as he is in himself bears God's likeness but rather that man is designated for and called to be a particular and in relationship with God. This concept of the image of God assures us that we, unlike any animal ancestry and the many inanimate objects of the universe, are privileged to have fellowship with the divine. But now we must admit that through our sinfulness, some of the image of God has left us. God's image has been terribly scarred by our sin. In, modern, in the modern world, we have tried to get away from the term sin. We have attempted to substitute it for high-sounding psychological phrases and other explanations that will relieve us of responsibility. But my friends, whether we want to accept it or not, man is a sinner in need of God's divine grace. Whenever a man looks deep down into the depths of his nature, he becomes painfully aware of the fact that the history of his life is the history of a constant revolt against God. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every nation, every class, and every man is a part of the gone wrongness of human nature. All of the silly, sentimental teachings which have ever characterized any generation, the denial of human sin is one of the worst. And yet man is not made to dwell in the valleys of sin and evil. Man is made for that which is high and noble. When I see how we fight vicious wars and destroy human life on bloody battlefields, I find myself seeing man is not made for that. When I see how we live our lives in selfishness and hate, again I say, man is not made for that. When I see how often we throw away the precious lives that God has given us in riotous living, again I find myself saying, man is not made for that. My friends, man is made for the stars, created for eternity, born for everlasting. Man is a child of the Almighty God, born for his everlasting fellowship. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visits him? For you hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. This is man's kingly prerogative, 
who this afternoon we will rise out of the dark and dreary valleys of sin and evil, realizing that man's proper home is in the high mountain of truth, beauty, and God. Yea, even where God the Eternal dwells forever. Martin Luther King, Jr. preached in 1954. A man who would later lose his life in a terrible act of violence. It is this relationship that we have together with God that can move mountains, that cares for the sick, that comforts the dying, and fills us with the hope and promise of new life. It is the reason we come together and meet here every Sunday to glorify God and praise the gift that we have been given through Jesus Christ. It is the reason we keep praying individually and corporately, expanding our opportunities to grow deeper in God's word and to seek the fellowship of Christ in every aspect of our lives. It is what John testifies to in the opening chapter of the gospel that we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Jesus turned water into wine, not so all could become drunk, but as a sign so that those who followed him, the blessed poor servants and disciples, would remain with him throughout his ministry. They would see the truth of who Jesus was and bear witness, as we do, to who Jesus is. When I became older, I still loved to go bowling with my Uncle Ted. It was on one of those occasions when I went with him with what I called the boys, his group of octogenarian friends, that I noticed that Ted was giving guidance to his friend Al. You see, Al was, for all intents and purposes, blind. But Ted would tell Al which pins were still standing at the end of the lane. And Al would know intuitively where to position himself to throw the ball. And it was remarkable to see this nearly blind man pick up strikes and spares with ease. You see, we hold that same skill in Jesus Christ. Perhaps it's been a while since we had a nice conversation with God. Or perhaps our conversations have become a little bit one-sided and we haven't spent too much time listening. But whatever the case, we are the ones in the know with a wonderful story the world is simply dying to hear. Because at the end of the day, no matter how many trophies and prizes that we seek, there is only one whose glory will never fade or wear out, and whose invitation to follow fills us with the goodness of God until our cup overflows. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you please stand and join me in our affirmation of faith? God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of the human mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But God reveals divine love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful men and women. The power of God's love in Christ to transform the world, discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of God's love. Amen. Please remain standing. We're going to sing a new hymn.
It's called Open the Eyes of My Heart. It's very easy and singable, and it's printed in your bulletin. So please, let's join our voices together. Beloved in Christ, go today, not with cups that are half full, but filled to the brim, in the knowledge and assurance that Jesus Christ goes with us. And may that peace guide you wherever Christ may lead you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again, unto Christ's door. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all God's people say, Amen. 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 